In this lecture, we will begin by looking at Japanese art before the year 1331. And then we will end by looking at Japanese art after the year 1331. Maybe the city Tokyo comes to mind when you think about Japan. Tokyo is the largest city in the world with 37 million people. Japan is a series of islands off the coast of Korea. It consists of four main islands, Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu, as well as hundreds of smaller ones. Chinese ideas will filter through Korea, passing to the Japanese. Japanese culture, however, does not share the isolation of some island civilizations, but rather has long demonstrated responsiveness to imported ideas like Buddhism. The early beliefs and practices of pre-Buddhist Japan come from a belief system later called Shinto, meaning the way of the gods. It explains where their ancestors came from, also has a devotion to life and goodness, as well as sacredness of spirits which are inherent in nature. Buddhism is the other main part of Japanese ideology. Let's now talk about the Nara period. This was the first permanent capital established in Japan because previously the capital was moving around because it was believed that the city would have been tainted by the emperor's death. Chinese political system will be adopted in the Nara period. There was a need for a huge administrative complexes because the city's population had exploded to 200,000. Emperors were so devout during this time period that they would renounce the throne to become monks and follow Buddha himself. Buddhist temples and shrines were erected and would become state-supported monastic training centers. This created a setting for public religious ceremonies one of the greatest, which was built in 752, known as the Great Buddha Hall. When completed in the 740s, the Great Eastern Temple was the largest building project ever on Japanese soil. Its creation reflects the complex intermingling of Buddhism and politics in early Japan. It was rebuilt in the 12th century and helped to found Japanese's most celebrated school of sculpture. It was built to impress. The roots of the Great Eastern Temple are found in the arrival of Buddhism in Japan in the 6th century. Buddhism made its way from India along the Silk Road through Central Asia, China, and Korea. This statue, which is 49 feet tall, was inspired by similar statues of the Buddha in China. Buddhism quickly became associated with the imperial court, whose members became the patrons of early Buddhist art and architecture. This connection between sacred and secular power would define Japan's ruling elite for centuries to come. The early Buddhist projects also reveal the receptivity of Japan to foreign ideas and goods as Buddhist monks and craftsmen came to Japan. Emperor Shomu's motives seem to have been a mix of the spiritual and the pragmatic. In his bid to unite various Japanese clans under his centralized rule, Shomu also promoted spiritual unity. The chief temple would also be the center of a national ritual. 
It was architecture to impress, displaying the power, prestige, and piety of the Imperial House of Japan. However, the project was not without its critics. Every person in Japan was required to contribute through a special tax to its construction. When completed, the entire Japanese court, government officials, and Buddhist dignitaries from China and India attended the Buddha's eye-opening ceremony. The Kamakura period was established because the courtiers of the Heian era were too engrossed in their own refinement, and they neglected governing of the country. The head of the Minamoto clan, Yoritomo, was in charge of the armed forces. They defeated the Tara family and ordered the emperor to appoint him shogun, or general-in-chief. The term shogun is an ancient military term that was adopted in the 12th century for the dominant warlord who held political and martial power in Japan while the emperor maintained his position as a figural head of state and cultural leader. The military capital of Japan moved to Kamakura off to the east near modern Tokyo. The night attack on the Sancho Palace, these scrolls uh, relate almost 100 years later events that happened in the 12th century. It is probably one of the most powerful battle scenes you could imagine anywhere. And for me, talking about them is a really emotional experience because it really describes the horrors of war in a very vivid way. When you read a hand scroll from right to left, typically you would be holding an expanse, just what you can hold right in front of you between your two hands, and you as the viewer are controlling it. And the activity starts rushing from the right hand side to the left hand side of the scroll. But the chaos of it, you get because they're layering these figures one on top of another. You get the whirring of the wheels and people being caught up in those whirls, the spokes as it goes by. You see that motion in it. And then you have these countervailing forces where people are coming from the left. And so he structures this event, which is capturing the abduction of the retired emperor and his younger sister by these upstart military warriors. They lead him out of the palace, which you will eventually see at the other end of the scroll. But in the process, they set the palace on fire. The women of the palace, who wear these incredibly heavy robes, are trying to flee. They don't want to be raped. So they jump into the well, and they suffocate each other. It's a great contrast between the aristocrats, who are done with these very fine features, almost no expression on their faces, and then these upstart warriors, who are animals, and they're given animal-like faces. And you see them cutting other people's heads off. There is a very conscious attempt to know what you need to see and what is the focal point and how to, in these crowd scenes, where to create these tensions. And um, I, I don't think there's any other work of art like it. あの、あの、スピードはもちろん違いますけど、あの、アニメーションと絵巻っていうのはそういう意味で非常に似た、あ、性格を持っています。あの、絵巻物を作りながら見れば見る人はそこにいる人物だとか建物だとか、それとそうい
the emperor and burn his palace. The samurai primarily fought using bows and arrows that would be used through archery on horseback. They would charge in full gallop and also practice hit and run strategies. The samurai sword known as the katana was worn at the waist. It is long and curved for slashing. The sharpness was difficult to manage with metallurgy and it could not have been achieved through the use of bronze. Instead, steel was used. The difficulty in forging a samurai sword is steel. The sword making master's solution was to wrap the forged blade with a hard cutting edge within less brittle support layers. The samurai armor was designed for warriors on horseback. It was brightly colored with silk braids that depended on which master they are serving. The upper legs are defended by a four-sided skirt and the head is protected by a helmet. There is a sense of an eyewitness account by way of the quick brisk, and lively brush strokes. This new world of samurai would dominate secular arts. Let's now look at Japanese art after the year 1333. Like Chinese, and Korean and those of Southeast Asia before, the Japanese art will also focus on asymmetry, abstraction, and boldness of expression. Zen Buddhism is imported from China. It consists of a mixture of Indian, Mahayana Buddhism, and Taoism. A central question to the religion is what is the meaning of life. Zen monks live austere lives, secluded behind walls like monasteries in the West. It's an activity for not engaging with the outside world. In quiet meditation, rock art is popular. These dry landscape courtyards became perfect for contemplation. This large, open expanse of rocks will also include borrowed scenery, which you see in the background. The center emphasizes severity and emptiness, a celebrated tradition in art and the landscape gardens. The rock gardens are continuously tended by the monks who rake it daily and remove any weeds that may have emerged. The garden consists of 15 artfully placed, irregularly shaped rocks of varying sizes set in a bed of white gravel with green moss growing on and around the stones. Karasansi is a term used to describe the landscape gardens. These places provide the monks with an austere and serene place where they can walk and meditate, far removed from the noise and distractions of daily life. There are multiple interpretations. One way to intellectualize the objects is to see the rocks as islands in the sea or mountain peaks, or they could be swimming tigers, 
and lastly constellations. The unknown designer intended the monks to view the garden from a stationary position, but from any vantage point it is possible to see only 14 rocks at one time, symbolizing the sense of incompleteness among experiences before achieving enlightenment. Here are three different ways to symbolize these metaphysical concepts. The last period we will look at is the Edo period, in which Tokugawa oversees a stable military regime in one of the most creative periods in Japan. He unifies the nation and forces the emperor to proclaim him Shogun. Edo is also where we get the name for Tokyo. This period had a rigid bureaucracy in which the feudal lords had to spend half of the year in Edo paying homage to the Shogun. During the 1630s, the Shogunate banned citizens from traveling abroad and restricted foreign access to the only international port. The emperor only allows in Koreans and they could only stop at the port and make trade. This was to prevent outside ideas, especially Christian missionaries, from coming in and converting his people. This also asserts power over foreign governments. The first encounter that the Japanese had was with Portuguese traders. Then the Dutch by the 1600s will bring tobacco and the telescope and revolutionize the way in which the Japanese view the world. Zen Buddhism would slowly be replaced by Neo-Confucianism that emphasized loyalty to the state. However, Pure Land Buddhism is still going to be the most popular among commoners. Society was divided into four classes. The top are the samurai, then you have farmers, artisans, and merchants. The merchants would supersede the samurai, gaining more money, power, and prestige. Since they controlled the money, we also have widespread literacy, and all had enough money to acquire their own art. As a result, we have a variety of styles based on the various consumers. The most successful sets of graphic arts in the world are made by two of the most famous printmakers who capture famous sites of Japan. You've seen this image before. A giant wave, its distinctive curly claws arched and ready to pounce. It's invoked when natural disaster strikes, but also when it's time to sell beer, jeans, and sweatshirts. It inspired Claude Debussy's orchestral work La Mer, as well as a not insignificant number of tattoos. It's an omnipresent image, and one used towards a variety of ends. Good grief, it's even an emoji. What is it about this image that continues to enthrall us? Let's better know the great wave. First off, the title is not The Great Wave, and its subject isn't really a wave. It's one of a series of woodblock prints called 36 Views of Mount Fuji, made by the Japanese printmaker Katsushika Hokusai between 1830 and 1833. Long considered sacred by followers of Shintoism and Buddhism, among others, Mount Fuji is depicted from a variety of perspectives, and our work in question is just one of them. Its actual title translates to Under the Wave off Kanagawa, because under is where Mount Fuji is nestled, far in the distance. Also under the wave are fishermen, just trying to get home after delivering fish to the city of Edo, rowing for their lives to escape the wave. But the great wave, of course, dominates the composition and has become an accepted title. Born near modern-day Tokyo in 1760, Hokusai was a prominent ukiyo-e artist, the name for the mass-produced woodblock prints of the Edo period. 
notable for their distillation of forms, emphasis on line and pure color, and depictions of hedonistic city life. Ukiyo-e means floating world, referring to the ephemerality of the fads and fashions of the time. This was not stuffy high art, but images available to a growing middle class for about the cost of a bowl of noodle soup. Hokusai was fascinated by the movement of water, exploring the subjects on many occasions throughout his career. And not just rough seas, but a few calmer moments too. In the 1830s when the Great Wave was created, Japan was largely shut off to the wider world due to the isolationist policies of the Tokugawa shogunate then in power. We can see Hokusai borrowing from Japanese rimpa school artists like Ogata Korin, especially in the tentacle-like projections from his waves. But Western realism was creeping into Japanese art nevertheless, largely due to European engravings smuggled in by Dutch traders. The Great Wave betrays a clear Western influence, the use of linear perspective, a low horizon line, and the appearance of Prussian blue, a synthetic pigment then very new to Japan, hailing from, that's right, Prussia. Thousands of copies of the Mount Fuji prints were released within Japan, mostly bought as souvenirs by an emerging market of domestic tourists and those making pilgrimages to the mountain. But in the 1850s after Hokusai's death, trade began to open up and his work was shown at the 1867 International Exposition in Paris. Japanese culture quickly became all the rage in Europe, and ukiyo-e prints were admired and collected by many, including Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, Mary Cassatt, and a number of artists who were heavily influenced by their depictions of city life, vivid colors, and what for them was a flattening of space. In 1896, a tsunami hit northern Japan, and news of its destruction spread worldwide. It's been hypothesized that this event, coupled with the Japanese craze, helped propel the great wave to international renown. Although the print does not depict a tsunami, in 2009, researchers identified it as a 32 to 39 foot tall rogue wave, or what they call a plunging breaker. It would certainly still be deadly, however, and that's where we get to the real and obvious drama of the picture. Nature is large, and we are small. This juxtaposition can be seen in the art of many cultures at many different times, but we have perhaps never seen it played out more clearly and more distinctly than here. Traditional Japanese landscapes of the time put the viewer at a remove from the action. But here we are right up against this pending disaster. Hokusai's contrast of near and far, and man-made and natural, heighten the tension and place us inside the narrative. When Debussy composed La Mer in 1903, he drew on his own childhood experience of surviving a terrifying storm on a fishing boat, as well as paintings by J.M.W. Turner, and Hokusai's print, which he selected for the score's cover. The image later illustrated a 1948 Pearl Buck novel that tells the story of a young boy from a Japanese fishing village who loses his family to a tidal wave, a post-World War II story of grief but also resilience. It's an image mobilized when disaster strikes, as it was after the devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami off the eastern coast of Japan. Scientists and empirical evidence tell us this print was incredibly influential, making its way to Western Europe and collected by artists at the end of the 19th century. Here we see a view of Mount Fuji in the far background with waves cresting in the foreground. The snowy crown-like foam you see at the crest of the wave is also similar to what you would see at the top of Mount Fuji and there is a relationship between the waves and the mountains. A term known as Japonismi would inspire modern art as we know it, especially Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. Thank you.